Back in 1990, I was on drugs real bad. I've been staying on the streets for a little while. I decided to go over to a friend of mine's house to get some rest, get some sleep and stuff like that. She said, let me stay. So I asked, can I stay for a couple of days? She said, yeah, you can stay here. So we was all in the room getting high. It was me, the lady that let me stay there, and a couple other guys that was there with us, about three or four more guys, and like four or five kids in the house. I got tired about 10, 11 o'clock at night. So I asked, can I go stay in one of the rooms and give me some sleep? She said, yeah. I went and checked one of the rooms. All the kids were in one room. So I went over to the other room. Wasn't nobody there. The next morning, I was sitting a little fire laying next to me. I said, what the hell is going on? When I went to sleep, she wasn't laying in the damn bed. So I walked in the kitchen. I didn't think nothing else about it until I was seeing the little girl went and told her mother that she was hurting downstairs. She didn't do a damn thing about it. All she was doing was about getting the next high. One of the kids came and ran up to me and said, excuse me of raping another little girl. Police came out, took me downstairs, put me in the car. Ambulance came up, checked the little girl, took her to the hospital, found out she was raped. So they, that's what they charged me with, aggravated sexual assault. So I, they locked me up for that. They took me to jail. So I did the DNA test with the police and they come to find out the girl had syphilis. I never had syphilis a day in my life. First plea was, they gave me 40 with a 20. I turned that down. Then they came back to me again with a 20 with a 10. I turned that down. They came with it back to me again, 10 with a five step. I said no. Took me to court every day for 16 days in a room, which we call it where I was at, we call it bullpen therapy. When you don't see no judge, you just sit in the bullpen. So I got tired of being, going to court for 16 days, every day not seeing a judge. I said, let's give me the charge. Let me go and do this time and get it over with. I come home, I ain't got to worry about this no more. So when I got out, I had to go down and register as a sex offender. Where I'm at now, I can't do nothing. I can't move where I want to move. I'm tired, I can't, I done got PTSD, and I can't take it no more. I need somebody to help me clear my name. Dealing with this and dealing with my mom being dead, I can't do it. For people to know, I ain't no rapist, I ain't no killer, I ain't no murderer. I just want to clear my name. Like, be in peace. I'm tired. If I don't get no help, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm just tired. I can't do it no more. They tell me I got to be a thousand feet from a school zone. I can't go around elementary schools. I can't move around daycare center. got to be a thousand feet. Everywhere that I move, I gotta start all over again. And I'm tired, I can't do it no more. There's a lot of restrictions yeah. when you become a, a registered sex offender. Yes. And before this incident with the rape, you had been in trouble with the law before. Yeah, I've been doing it. I do little petty crimes. Right. They need my next eye. So I'm saying you kind of understood that, you know, being arrested is one thing, but being arrested for rape of a five-year-old child. Yeah, it was something that's, different. That's yeah, serious. That's, that was gonna be something that, uh, was going to be, you know, pretty tough. No. You said that they came at you, they offered you 40 years, then 20 years, then 10 years, and that you had to go to court 16 days in a row and sit in this bullpen section, right? Yeah. And then you said, well, I got tired of it, so I said, let me go ahead and serve this time. Really, like, how big was the convenience sitting in court for 16 straight days to, to making that leap or... I don't want to go to court anymore. Give me the time. I, got, I, I mean, was that kind of a foolish decision? No. To me, I didn't know nothing about it, about the system that you could pick 12, the jury. I didn't know nothing about it, all that. I was young and didn't know nothing about it, just the system. So I said, well, I'm getting tired of going back to court every day, wake me up 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning, get ready to go to court. Then take me downstairs to the book, down to the cell where they kept. Were you two. still in custody at this point? Yeah. Okay. And well, they kept taking me to court, taking me downstairs, put me in a, in a cell with all the inmates just to go see a judge. I got tired of going doing all that. So when you finally said, okay, give me this deal or this plea, what did they give you as far as time goes? They gave me um, 10 flat. 10 years? 10, yeah. And how, how, how many years did you serve? Oh, uh, for that, I did six years, four months. For something that you say you didn't do? Yeah. So you get out of prison, 
and you kind of thought, like, no, I could just go on with my life. Yeah, so until I moved to where I'm at now, every time I move, I got to do it all over again and start the whole 10 years for the rest of it all over again. Now, you, uh, you're married now? Yes. And how long you been with your wife? Well, I've been with my wife 21 years. 21 years. We so, just got married in 2019. Yeah, but you've been with her a long time. Yeah. So when you get out of prison and you meet her, how awkward is to say, yeah, I went to prison for raping a five-year-old? Well, when I told her about it, I didn't come right out and tell her. I waited about a week or two. Yeah. Until we started. Oh, well, yeah, you don't want to say that on your first date. Nah. I waited, waited about a couple weeks. Yeah. I told her about it. She didn't look at me different or nothing. She, because you told her you didn't do it, right? Yeah, I told her that. I didn't do it. How you doing, Blanca? Hi, how are you? Good. Um, you know, you're here today because your husband pled guilty to raping a five-year-old girl. Yes. Yeah. All right, Lamont. You were, uh, you, you served All time right. for raping a five-year-old girl. You said you're innocent. You took the plea to kind of get over the experience you were going through at the time. You've lived with this for a long time. Because of it, your life is very difficult, you and your wife. And at the very least, you want to clear your name so people at least look at you and say, he didn't do that. <laughs> so you came here, and we gave you a lie detector test. And we asked you, did you at any time bring a five-year-old into your bed for purposes of engaging in sexual acts? No. You answered no. Did you, while that five-year-old was in your bed with you, touch, rub, or fondle that child for sexual purposes? You answered no. no. The results came back the same to each of those questions, and it came back that Lamont told the truth. Ah! 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 You got what you needed. Now we push forward <laughs> from here. You keep on going. I told you I got your back. I got your back. Give me a kiss. <laughs> I told you. <laughs> this does happen, and I, I, and I realize with doing this show, we see a lot where, uh, you know, innocent people go to jail sometimes. And, uh, you know, the system I sometimes I think is uh, set up to wear you down, where, like it did wear you it down. It did me wear me down. We've been in guard of court 16 days in a row. Yeah. Having a public defender, they didn't even know my name. No. Every time they went in, she wouldn't call my name, she had to look down on my, my chart yeah. to call my name. Um, she didn't try to help me. Oh, uh, so I want to read a, a note from the examiner. A score of plus three is required to pass a uh, lie detector test. Lamont scored a plus 26. Ah, ah, so, um, ah, see? Off see? the charts, telling the truth. Um, we're very happy for you. I know. This test brings a sense of relief. Not that you said you had any doubts, but I'm sure there's family members and everybody else that maybe gives them a little side eye. We wish you all the best of luck. Thank you. Good Thank luck. you. I remember is being 16, 17 years old, drinking, partying with my so-called mom. I went to make a phone call at an apartment building where she was renting an apartment. There was a lot of fire trucks on the street. I did not know it was my house that was on fire. I went to my mother's other apartment to take a shower. Got out of the shower, detectives knocked on the door, and they said, we have a feeling that you were <clears throat> involved with a fire that was started earlier this afternoon. I was being charged with arson, but on the other hand, they told me I was being charged with three attempted murders. My bail was set at $1 million. The three attempted murders were caused from a mother and two daughters sleeping next door at the duplex that was started on fire. When I went to court, I had a court appointed lawyer that told me to either take a plea bargain or face the four felonies that I was actually facing. So. Me being 17 and scared, I decided I was going to take the plea bargain of fourth, arson in a fourth degree. I went to jail for two years, 
and I was scared because I sat in there next to murderers and rapists. After my jail time, I was mandated to a rehab, and now I have restitution and I'm paying $115,000. That's a lot of money for a crime that I didn't do. Jeff, tell me what happened the day the house burnt down. I was staying with her, with my mother, at an apartment. I um, went over to the apartment she was renting to make a phone call. Nobody answered the phone. I went back to the apartment where she was staying. I was drinking, doing drugs, stuff like that. Uh, how old were you at the time? I was approximately 16, 17 years old. OK. I went back to the apartment, and the fire department were on that street where we lived. Went to another apartment where she was renting at the time, a secondary apartment, and took a shower. I smoked cigarettes at the time, so I had matches, no lighter, and detectives knocked on the door. They asked me to, for a couple questions and stuff like that, so I answered the questions, and they said, well, can you empty your pockets? I emptied my pockets. They grabbed a book of matches and cigarettes out of my pockets, and I said, what's going on? They said, well, the fire was started with matches. They smelt my hands, they smelt matches. At that point, I was arrested and brought down to the police station, charged with arson and attempted murders at the time. So did you set the house on fire? No, Steve, I did not. No. Jeff. Get away from me. Stay I on love the other side you. of the no. Stay away. Stay over there on the other side of the I don't want nothing to do with you. I don't. You ruined my life for the fun of it, so you could go out and do whatever the hell you want to do, start drinking and drugging. Don't give me any of that. Stay over there. I don't want nothing to do with you. You're not allowed around my kids, my wife, nobody in my family. I realize a mother's supposed to protect her kid, but I had no, no choice stop right there. that day. You're do lying. Do you even know the whole story? I do know the whole story. You're lying. Well, and I'd like to hear the whole story. That, OK. They picked him up that morning, Steve. OK, took him down to the police station. Next thing I know, they're coming to get me, OK, because supposedly I started the fire. OK. I wasn't even at that house. Did you start the fire? No. I was nowhere around that house. So no way that you started the fire? No. And what no. makes you think that Jeff started the fire? OK, because he had come back that morning, OK, before they picked me up. And he said, Mom, I set your house on fire. The what? He set my house on fire. He said, hey, Mom, I set your house yes. on fire. Yes. And what was your reaction to that? No, no, no way, no way. The mother said he did it, wrote a statement, and the cops found matches on him. And you really want to, do you expect Jeff to say, yeah, Mom, I want you back in my life. I want you to meet my grandsons. Probably not. But yeah. it was a, it was it's a It's your shoot for the moon, right? Yeah, I mean. OK, you haven't seen him in over 10 years. What, here's your chance. Listen, Jeff, I do love you, OK? And I really would like to put this behind us. And I know you can't just, oh, it's all fine, Mom, OK? I know you can't do that, OK? Back then, I was young, OK? I was stupid. I made bad choices. It's different. You still do. If I'm wrong about all this, I'm telling you, I'm going to step up the plate, and I'm going to own it. There's nothing you can do. You know why? Because I've done my time. I've accepted the fact that my mother's always going to be a piece of garbage, and you're never going to ex accept responsibility for your own actions by signing that statement to begin with. You screwed my life up, and where, where was your life headed? Out there still drinking and drugging like you always do. Just because you say that you cleaned your act up, I don't believe nothing that comes out of that filthy sewer of yours. Tammy's on stage. What do you want to say to her, Charity? Um, really, I just, I just want to say that I, I wish you would just come clean. I wish you would, you know, stop lying and telling the truth. Um, a good mom would just support her son no matter what. They, they don't do what you did. And, you know, the fact of the matter is, it's it's not even just him. Like, you've done damage to all your children. It, it's, it's sad, and it, it's hurtful that you can go about your life and, like, nothing happened. 
he has to suffer every day. Like I said, I made bad choices in the past. I'll admit I was a okay? But I'm trying to straighten up now. When you hear Tammy talk, you kind of get the feeling like, yeah, she totally railroaded you. She, she doesn't even know if you told her like what she told the cops. <laughs> did Jeff tell you they burned the house? I don't know. I was drunk and high. Maybe didn't. Maybe did. I, I'm not sure. That's because she tells so many lies. She, believes she admits that she saved her own ass by making that statement to the police that she wrote it, which means they had nothing on you except her statement. Okay. Exactly. So if she doesn't do that, you probably don't lose two years of life and have this uh, over your head for the rest of your life where you can't get a decent job, where you and your wife struggle to pay the bills and pay restitution on a crime you didn't commit. Exactly. I mean, think about that. Pay money, out of the, he goes to work, she's working two jobs, and they gotta take that money and pay somebody for something they didn't do. I don't know mm -hmm. if I'd be forgiven either. Okay, Jeff came here, took a lot of tech to test. We asked Jeff, approximately 20 years ago, did you set that house fire? He answered no. Approximately 20 years ago, did you participate in any way in setting that house fire? He answered no. The results came back the same to each question, and it came back that Jeff told the truth. That's I, awesome. I told you so That's from day awesome. one, right up till now, that I did not start that fire, and you still wrote a statement liar. against me anyways. You can live in a dumpster for all I freaking care, mm -hmm. because you're nothing to me, and you never will be. You always used to tell me when I was a kid, I brought you into this world, I will take you out. And guess what? You ruined my life for what purpose? This is going to be the last time okay. I ever talk to you, I ever freaking see you. Okay. Ever. Ever, ever, ever in my whole freaking life. So you your son why? is about to walk off stage. You're never going to ever see him for the rest of your living days. What do you want to say to him? It's his choice. Oh, There's nothing the, I hey, can you know, say. With, with of course pleasure, it is my choice. With, what can I say? You know all my life. Help. You said one statement on the stage the whole time you've been out here. The one thing right. You are a With that, get the hell off my stage. Okay. Enjoy your ride home. You overcame a lot of obstacles. You could have got out of jail and became just like your mother. Being a victim, drinking, doing drugs, never turning your life around. You did it. Yes, life's a struggle, but like I said, I admire a guy like you that has fought through all those, all the odds against you and made something of yourself. You're not drawing a big paycheck, but you're a good father, a good husband, and like I said, that means a lot more than money. Good luck to you. I'd like to thank my wife, Charity, and my three little boys that I have at home for giving me the support to come down here. Well, I'm glad. Thank you, Charity. You take care of this guy, will you? I will. I want to clear my name. It's like I'm tired of being. I'm not tired of going through life and not being able to accomplish nothing because this thing always pops up on my background. Like I can't find housing. I can't. Like I, I've been living in my car. Uh, like my some of my siblings don't even talk to me because it's man. a man's not gonna take advantage of a no woman, man. Terry point blank. And even as a kid, I knew better than that. We were in the park. Um, we kissed on each other. We like touched on each other or whatever, but no sexual acts ever even happened. A month later, while I was at school, uh, I was eating a cup of noodle in class and a security guard came in and told me there was two detectives who wanted to talk to me. And me being 12 years old, like the only time I've ever seen a detective was on TV. And I went in the office and I talked to those detectives. And once I got into the office, it was like, the detectives pretty much like wrote my statement for me. And I sat there and agreed with half of the stuff that they were saying because I didn't want to get in trouble. It was my first time ever dealing with the police. Parents weren't there. I didn't have an attorney present. Um, not even a teacher was in the, was present. Not a school security guard. Nobody was present. I went to JDH. I did three months in JDH. I was approached by my attorney, uh, my court-appointed attorney, while my parents was in Bakersfield, California, with a plea bargain. And the plea bargain basically told me either I could do time in jail or I could sign a paper and go home. And me being 12 years old, I, I wanted to go home. 
And so when I signed the paper, it's like, I didn't, I didn't understand what I was fully agreeing to. It's like 12 years old, I don't understand words like adjudication and, and all these other big courtroom words. It, it, I was 12 years old, I was a kid. I was understanding like gummy bears and stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? I didn't understand. Um, I did seven years for a rape charge that I know I didn't commit and I'm here to clear my name on it. Being incarcerated, I missed out on middle school. I didn't even get to finish middle school. I didn't get to see a prom. I didn't get a football game. I didn't get a, a, a first kiss from a girl who it, it didn't, you know what I'm saying? Like being, in, being incarcerated and being around people who actually like admitted to committing these crimes and having to hear this stuff, it's like, I know right from wrong. And I know what, like you know what I'm saying, the stuff that they said, that was it was wrong. You know what I'm saying? People have like, like touched child, like children. Like, I know better than that. Since being released from the jails, I've, I've had to register as a sex offender and that's been like, I don't know, it's been a hard part of my life. It's like me not having nowhere to go. I feel like I was used, but like, like they just they took it, they took it from me and they just had no remorse over it. They took my life and didn't have no remorse for it. I didn't see my mom for like 10 years while I was incarcerated. She had moved uh, first to Astoria, Oregon, and then she had moved to Las Vegas while I was in there. And so it's like, that family time wasn't really there, so it's like, I got stripped of my family time, I got stripped of my childhood, my school. I, I just got stripped. My mom passed away two years after I got out of jail. Like, I wanna talk about shit, bro. I made a promise to my mom that I was gonna make something of myself. And then she passed away a couple weeks later. I gotta do something, man. And it's like really, it's like holding my whole life back. That's why I called into the show. I'm tired of being harassed about this, and I'm tired of like talking to people about this. I'm tired of like, I'm tired of being really a part of my life, man. But I know what I did. I know I guarantee did not commit no crime. So you were 12 years old. You go to school one day, and you get charged with rape. Uh, and then you're in the juvenile system for how long? Eight years. Eight years. Then you become an adult, right, and they, you get out. Why now? Why are you here now? What do you hope to achieve? This was actually the only chance that I got to clear my name. Like, I've tried other ways. I've tried to, like, contact the courts. I've tried to contact uh, dist uh, the attorneys, district attorneys, but nobody was trying to hear it. Did you have intercourse? Did you rape uh, a girl when you were 12 years old? No. Why? How did this come about? Uh, like, we had made a pact to lose our virginities with each other, and, like, uh, we were at a park. It was me, that, uh, that friend or whatever, and two of our other friends, and, uh, we like kissed on each other, like touched on each other, whatever, but no like sexual acts ever happened. Right. Like a month later or so, I'm sitting in class and that's when the detectives, or the uh, a month security later. guard, yeah, a month, like, a month later, security guard came in and said, hey, there's two detectives in the office that want to speak to you. Yeah. So I got to imagine a month later, there's certainly no DNA no evidence. Idea, right. No, they said they had DNA evidence. Uh, after a month? Yeah. Okay. And yeah, did they? Not. No. Yeah. No. So, you know, this robbed you of your childhood. Yeah, and it still robbed me of my adulthood. I had Section 8, bro. I lost my Section 8 because I couldn't find nobody to rent to me. I've had, like, numerous jobs that I've lost just because they ran my background after they gave me the job and they took the job away from me. I've sold drugs and stuff just to, just to get by or whatever, and yeah. it's not working out. It's just going to end up, like, landing me back in jail. You know, I was told that you took a lie detector test in the past. Yeah, I passed my, uh, when I was 13 years old, I took a lie detector test and I passed it, but somehow it just disappeared from the courts. Now, your victim, or, you know, yeah. the girl that they're accused of, what, uh, was she white? Was she, she black? Was white. She was a white, she white girl. I was told later on that her, uh, because my lawyer had came in and asked me if I knew who the Ku Klux Klan was. And I was like, uh, yeah, I've heard of them before because I've been to Louisiana plenty of times or whatever. And, like, she was like, well, her like a uh, And I'm like, what? And it's like, out of all the well, people in the see, world. See, that's kind of where I was getting at, asking you earlier about circumstances. Uh, I, I was told that you lived in a predominantly white neighborhood. I live in an all white neighborhood. All white neighborhood. So do you think the fact that you're a young black man with this white girl, her parents find out about positive. it, that positive. this positive probably had a lot it. to do with it? Positive has something to do with it. Because the first thing they tried to do, like, before they even pressed charges on me, they tried to sue my dad. Sue your dad for what? Right. 
because I was his child, but it's like, if, you're, if my daughter was hurt, I want to see a person in jail before anything. I'm not worried about the money until later on in life or whatever the situation is with the whole suing my dad thing, but it's like my dad, first and foremost, he told him off the top, he says, I'm not the one on trial. I have no, like, I have nothing to do with none of this. Right. So why would you even attempt to, like, try to sue me, especially when your daughter had, you haven't even pressed charges for your daughter yet. I'm here today to find out if my boyfriend Daniel is guilty of rape. He's trying to clear his name, and he has been for years. This charge has followed him since he's been 12. Um, he's been fighting it since then, so for, like, over 20 years. Me and Daniel have been together for five months, going on six months. And, you know, it's been hard because you can tell it really affects him. Like, he doesn't, I don't know, he, he gets angry easy. We've been fighting um, recently, like, because of his anxiousness. And I'm anxious. I want him, I want to prove, we both want him to prove his name. When me and Daniel first got together, um, I asked him what his criminal background was, and he was completely honest with me and told me straight up what it was. He told me everything, told me the charge, told me details about it and everything, and I look at it as everybody can change and, you know, he can be a different person. Like, people can say what they want about me being with a sex offender, but if he served his time and if that's the crime that he actually did, if he served his time and he's never made me feel uncomfortable or made me feel any type of way. By Daniel taking this lie detector test today, if he fails, I would be in shock just because of things that he's told me and like emotions that he's shown me, like it makes me believe him, I would be in shock. But at the same time, don't make me look stupid. Like don't have me come all the way out here looking stupid. Like he would have betrayed my trust by lying to me in the first place and so that's like, like, that's where the deal is, is, like, you lie to me instead of telling me the truth, you know? But if he fails, like, I don't know what's, I don't know where I'm going to go from there. Daniel came here uh, to take a lie detector test about uh, an occurrence that happened when he was 12 years old where he was charged with rape. And we asked him, did you ever have consensual sex with your classmate? He answered no. Did you ever force yourself on your classmate? He answered no. Did you engage in physical sexual acts against your classmate's will at any time? He answered no. The results came back all the same, and they came back that Daniel told the truth. <laughs> It's been so long that I just, I don't know. I don't know if it's real or if it's fake or... No. I just wish my mom was here. No. Um, I'm sorry that people had to, I believe, use your race against you. I, I certainly believe that's the case. I hope being on the show today shows people that you're not that person. Before we end this, what do you want to say to Janelle? I love you. Love you too. I hope this helped you. Good luck to you. Wish you all the best of luck. My mother got accused of trying to kill me when I was a baby, and it was caught on tape. I mean, just growing up without mom, you know, I couldn't do like those motherly things with her. <laughs> when I was growing up, going to school, a lot of people didn't believe me that I didn't have a mom. They were like, oh, you're just joking. Or when they did realize I didn't have a mom, I always got picked at because my dad was always there in the picture. I remember elementary school, we had to do Mother's Day crafts and I was always making them for my dad. And it was very upsetting because all the kids would laugh at me and, you know, because I didn't have a mom. So when I was 13 years old, I started Googling myself. And the first couple articles came up was Alabama woman smothering her child. And me being me, I clicked on it. And it was just, you know, it said my name, like my full name. And I was just stunned there, shock. And we were in a school computer lab. So everyone's gathering around me. And I'm just like, you know, this can't be real. This is not happening. I kept reading more. Uh, I read that she tried to smother me with her hand and over my nose and mouth. And I read about the case, about I was dead for a couple minutes, I was pronounced dead for a couple minutes. And while other people are looking at me like, oh my gosh, your mother's crazy. And I ran to the bathroom crying. 
because I couldn't believe what I just read. When I got home that night, my dad didn't really talk about it too much. He says that we'll talk about it when you get older. I mean, obviously, I'm still looking it up, still reading about everything. My mother was charged with attempted murder, but she pled guilty to child abuse. So I, ha I found out that my mom had a child before me who died, and whenever I would bring that up to my dad when I was younger, he didn't say anything. He's like, oh, well, he was very sick. He died. That was about it. He was very sick and he died. He didn't tell me that, you know, my case and his case were linked. His death was from seizures, but it was kind of like the same seizures that I was having where they were linked our case saying it was both by smothering. I was 16 years old when I got in contact with my mother and you know, I was happy I finally got, found my mother and I'm talking to her and it was just so surreal. Like I would talk about her about everything and then I didn't finally get to meet her until I was 19 years old. And when I met her for the first time, we bawled. We stand there, we were bawling our eyes out. I never really saw her other than photos and it was just an overwhelming sensation. And she said that she wasn't trying to smother me. She was trying to put a binky in my mouth at the time. And that, you know, it was a big whole misunderstanding with the hospital at the time. She told me that she had to give up her right to see me. I did believe her um, because, you know, she's a mom. I mean, I do have some doubt, don't get me wrong. I mean, I feel like everyone would if you have two sides of the story because you don't know which one's real or which one's true, which one's not true. If my mom fails, I don't think we'll have that, you know, relationship that she wants and what I want of having that mother-daughter relationship. And it's, you know, I feel very bad bad for my son because he loves his grandmother so much he will go to her open arms and like smile and hugs and give her kisses he loves her but at the same time I have to be that mother and like make sure that my son comes first and be safe uh, Stephanie did you try to kill your daughter in 2001 no absolutely not um, what happened was um, she was in ICU. We took her to the hospital. She was sick. She had RSV, upper respiratory infection that babies get, okay. <clears throat> and they say older people can get it as well. We took her to the hospital, um, and we never mentioned seizures, so I don't know where they got seizures from. Um, they told me when they moved her to the private room that they had a camera in there um, to monitor her to make sure that she didn't have any more breathing issues or anything like that. I mean, I knew the whole time that there was a camera in there. You know, it would be crazy to try to suffocate their child knowing that there's a camera in there. And I'm not crazy. What they told me was my hand was cut off from view. And I was rocking her like this. I had my arm across her back because I was supporting her. I had my two fingers holding a pacifier in her mouth. And they said that because her cry was muffled, that it appeared that my hand could have been over her mouth. Um, I got two years in jail or in prison, which I had already served a year. Right. So I only had, or I only had to do 11 months in prison, and then I got 10 years probation. But they ended up taking me off probation after two years. Yeah. How long after you got out of prison till you saw your daughter again? Um, 17 years. During those 17 years, I mean, how hard was it not? It was very difficult um, not being there for her birthdays uh, or Christmas, um, not, not knowing if she was okay, um, not being there when she's hurting, and then now finding out that she was bullied because she didn't have a mother is very heartbreaking. Yeah. When, when and how did you reconnect with her? Um, I drove up to Pennsylvania to meet her, and it was, <clears throat> it was bittersweet. It was tearful. She's amazing. She has the kindest heart. When you're backstage and when you're listening to your mother tell the story, what runs through your mind? I got told two different stories, so, like, I'm trying to piece together. Two different stories by whom? Uh, one by my, your mother and then one by... My dad. Okay. So I'm trying to like. What'd your dad tell you? Uh, he did try. He did tell me that she did try to smother me, and I was pronounced dead for a couple minutes. 
and that I was starting to turn blue, I wasn't breathing, and that doctors came in and they rushed me the CPR. So when you're growing up and your mom's not around, where did you think your mom was? I didn't think she loved me. I thought that she left um, because that's what my dad says. He, he always says that she left. He never told me that, like, obviously she didn't love me, but it was Did just, you know she was in prison at all? No, I did not know she was in prison. Now, you go on, um, uh, and you have uh, one son? Yes, I have one son. You know, when I found out I was pregnant, I was very, um, I was obviously very scared because I didn't, I didn't know what was going to happen to me. And it was very, like, especially with my mom, because, like I said in the tape, like, I had a panic attack when he was first born. And just the thought of leaving him alone with her just... Scares you. It did. It yeah. very much did so. I mean, she didn't do it. Why didn't she try to fight for me? I did. I hired an attorney, baby, and y'all kept moving. Your dad kept moving, and I kept begging him to see you. And he never would let me see you. I mean, Mom, even when back with the trial, you pled guilty, and... I know. And the reason I pled guilty is because my attorney said that I had such bad publicity that I wouldn't get a fair trial and that if I pled guilty, at least I would get to see you because that was a condition of our divorce is supervised visitation. And I didn't want to take a chance of never getting to see you again. Mom, it's not even about me. It's also my brother. I mean, when my dad hired that private investigator, he said that you didn't go in the ambulance. He talked to the EMTs that night. Yeah, I was in the ambulance, sweetie. Like, it's very all, like, I'm getting two sides of the story, okay. and I have to pick and choose which ones I have to believe. Stephanie, uh... Are you now withholding vital information about your son's death in 1996 that you are afraid to share? You answer no. Did you cause the death of your son in 1996? You answered no. Did you ever fabricate illness about your daughter, Alicia, to gain attention for yourself? You answer no. Did you smother your daughter, Alicia, in 2001 with your hand? You answered no. Did you attempt to kill your daughter, Alicia, in the hospital in order to get attention for yourself? You answered no. The results came back the same to each one of those five questions, and it came back that Stephanie told the truth. <laughs> Well, I mean, I knew I was telling the truth. I knew I didn't have anything but to still, hide. But still, it's not an easy thing to do. Yeah. And I give you credit for that. At least now you can move forward and start building memories now. Thank you for appearing on the show, and good luck to both of you with your relationship. In 1996, 21-year-old Ricky Kidd's freedom was taken from him after he was convicted of two counts of first-degree murder. He was sentenced to life in prison without parole. But Ricky always maintained his innocence and spent over two decades fighting to regain his freedom. After 23 years in prison and many denied requests for an appeal, he was finally released in 2019. The prosecution dismissed the charges. Today, he's here to tell us what he's been doing with his newfound freedom. Take a look. February 6, 1996, I was 21 years of age. I was living a life, uh, living my life living with my girlfriend. Um, it was just another day for me. It was just another day as it would be for anybody. Unbeknown to me at the time, on the south side of Kansas City, a double homicide was taking place. Shockingly, days later, police surrounded my car as I was leaving my apartment with guns drawn, and they arrested myself I fully cooperated, she fully cooperated, uh, and then they released us. I ended up being convicted on two counts of first degree murder and two counts of armed criminal action. They sentenced me to four life sentences 
without the possibility of parole for a crime I did not commit. I thought, where's the evidence that I was actually guilty of this crime? And the next 23 years for me was a hell hole. We're being offloaded from the bus. We're handcuffed and shackled. And one of the guards greet us with the salutation of welcome to hell. That hell for me was being in a place surrounded by barbed wire, electric fence, concrete and steel. That hell for me was being surrounded by other individuals who were actually guilty of their crime. Rapists, murderers, robbers, men who were convicted of their crimes but were not done committing their crimes. Inside prison, whispers began to come fast to be careful and to watch my back. Whistles, I'm a 21 year old, not bad looking guy. Whistles would come from across the yard of guys whistling as if they would whistle at a female, but they're whistling at me and others. I'm in rural America where a lot of these individuals, staff members, haven't had a lot of interactions with African-Americans so they treated us different. They treated us as if we, as if all of us belonged there. I'm going to treat you less than the human that you are. I had to find a way to get out of my nightmare. And the only way out is through an appeal process. So I began to immediately learn about the appeal process. I would go to the law library. I would look at cases. I would reach out to lawyers, to organizations, to media, to anybody with eyes and ears and say, hey, I'm innocent. I need help. I need help. I lost 11 times before I finally won the last appeal. One of my lawyers picked up the phone the lawyer had got on the phone and that is when he said you're free you're a free man the judge has decided to set you free I waited 23 years and three months for this decision and I cried my hardest cry for about 20 minutes but it was the best feeling that I ever experienced and so indeed I was free I was free. The next day, August 15th, 2019, the judge had released the order that set me free. And I was free indeed. And I thought about this long and hard over the 23 years in prison. If I was ever to regain my freedom, what would I want that to look like? And I knew that I wanted to roll up my sleeves, that I wanted to become involved in raising awareness about wrongful convictions. I had taken the time to study the issues of wrongful convictions. And so when I came home, I did not grow grass under my feet. Under my feet. I began hopping on planes, crisscrossing the country, sharing my cautionary tale of broken justice uh, and having people to listen and understand some of the complexities and nuances surrounding wrongful conviction. I saw the issue of wrongful convictions as a silent crisis in America. And I wanted to use my voice to be that voice for those who are voiceless. I found my purpose. I found my passion. I found the love of my life. We end up having a baby, a beautiful baby. Life turned full circle for me. And for 23 years and three months, I experienced the downside of it all. But in a moment, in a moment, in the signature, in a 107-page order from the judge, it all turned around. And now I'm experiencing the upside of life. So you get arrested. Um, and did you go to trial or did you take a plea? It was trial. trial. It, was, it was definitely yeah, a trial. Because yes, sir. Why, why not go to trial? Because if you're facing double murder, I'm sure they're not offering you a plea to begin with, right? No, there yeah. was no opportunity <laughs> for a plea, nor would I have taken a plea. I expected the verdict to be not guilty and that I would go sure, home. Yeah. Now, now, Ricky, how are you so happy in life right now? It was a choice, Steve. 
It was a choice. And we all have that choice. You could be bitter or you could be better. Uh, I made a conscious choice to be better. But let me be very clear because the question comes up, Ricky, are you or were you angry? And the answer to that is an emphatic yes. What you're seeing right now, that's my anger channeled into passion. After 21 years, did you get hard? You know, did you, did you, did you get an edge on you after 21 years? I did. You have to become tough. Uh, that's Listen, my point. Like, 21 years, I don't know if you're walking through there being soft. You, you can't. Can we have an honest moment? Because you can't. You're either the prey or the predator. So the now, lady. your lawyer made us a tape, and we're going to watch that now. I'm Sean O'Brien, professor at UMKC Law School. I met Ricky Kidd in 2006 when an investigator called his case to my attention and he showed me things that convinced me at first that he didn't get a fair trial. And later as I dug deeper, I came to believe, actually I came to know uh, that he was innocent. I led the investigation, I wrote all the briefs, and I conducted the hearing that set Ricky free. Uh, not until 2019, that was uh, 14 years after I had stepped into the case. Um, to understand my relationship with Ricky, you need to know that we lost his case many times before we finally won. And so I'm proud of Ricky because of the grace and the resilience that he showed in the face of defeat over and over and over. It's kind of funny because each time we lost, I was trying to be strong for Ricky. And at the same time, he was trying to be strong for me. And I think that's how we got through this together. I mean, I, I truly was worried uh, more than once that the system was going to let an innocent man die in prison. And I think he was worried, too. Um, and so I'm really proud of Ricky, um, that he's been able to resume his life, reconnect with his family, and be a model for others. I know that he's up to it because... The darkest days are in the rearview mirror. I just, I can't tell you how proud I am of Ricky and, you know, the special bond that we're going to have uh, for the rest of our lives. He is a once in a lifetime experience, right? An amazing person that you meet once. There's only one Ricky kid. And I think that when somebody goes through an experience like that, you let it define you or you define it. And I think Ricky has done a really good job of defining it. You know, he is resilient. And what he truly stands for can be an example for so many other people. We don't often get to choose our difficulty or challenge. But we do get to choose how we respond to that difficulty and challenge. That we do get to do. And that's what I hope my life and my journey has reflected or will continue to reflect upon the individuals who learn about my story, that we get to decide how we respond to life difficulties and life challenges. I couldn't say it any better, my friend. Prove that he did not hit the policeman. He wants that closure. Did he or did he not? That is the question. And that's what we're here for, to prove his innocence. Randy was the child the quietest child, the mannerest child. He always was home. He was, ne he was the child that was never no trouble, never. You know, I have seven children. 2015, I was going down to Montgomery, Alabama with my friend to celebrate my five-year anniversary. I get a news feed. All I see is my child running up Walnut Street. And then my daughter says, Randy's in trouble. He hit a policeman. And my heart just sank, because I'm like 1,400 miles away. I'm going to get home. I couldn't get home right away. So when I got home, I went to go see him. And he said, Mama, I don't know what happened. I said, son, why didn't you follow my direction? And he says, I don't know, Mama, but I'm sorry. And so I, I went to go see him. I, Start looking for a lawyer. And then I found a lawyer, and we start working on this case. They bounded him over at 15, 
And at 16, I lost my child for four years. I went up every three months for four years. I told my son, I said, look here. I want you to go to school. I want you to get your high school diploma. I want you to take every course that they have for the next four years. He says, Mama, how am I going to get any money? I said, don't worry about the money. I said, I'll make sure you have what you need. I said, I want you to get your education and get as much work experience as you possibly can. He got his high school diploma. He got a couple of degrees and some classes. This child did a eight, 980 degree turn from the time he walked in that prison. And he has been phenomenal ever since. He got out of prison. I got him a job. He bought his first car. About a year and a half, he finally moved out, got another job, bought another car, and now he's a father. Randy said, Mom, you want to hear some good news? He said, what do you think the good news is? I said, I don't know, Randy. What's the good news? Tell me. It's a lot of things to be a good news. He says, I'm off of parole. I said, you kidding me? He said, yeah, I'm off of parole. I said, you need to call Steve. I said, you want to do this? He said, yeah, mama. I said, then you need to pick up the phone and make the call. And he did. And we're here. Randy, what happened that night? It was me and a few friends. We, it was an all-star all -star game that night. It was 4th of July. So we already knew it was going to be a lot of people downtown that night. It was going to be a, a lot of fun that night. So we just decided just to go hang out. So. Me and my friends ended up separating, like, as it got closer towards dark. So, like, I'm drunk. Like, of course, I was drinking that night as well. Um, we ended up separating, though. So, like, I was, I was by myself. The next time I seen one of my friends, he ended up getting tased that night by a cop. So that's where the situation escalated. Like, that's where I got involved. That's where my other friends got involved. Now, the, the situation after my friend got tased, I was with my other, other friends, like the friends I came down there with that night. Um, they was getting rowdy with the police. They, I seen them get into a confrontation with the police. So me, being myself, I tried to stop one of my friends from getting any, going any further with escalating with the police. I was pushing my friend back. Like, I was pushing him back. Like, I'm telling him to stop. Like, I'm telling him to stop. I was forcibly pushing him back. In the midst of me trying to get him to stop, I ended up grabbing him. Like, I bear, I bear hug, grabbed him. And then, all of a sudden, I just feel another presence on me. Like, and it was, it was a cop. If I can explain the situation, it was like, he moved me out the way, took him to the ground. But I'm still standing here. And in that midst of time, I seen a punch just fly across my knees and straight to the cop's face. The guy dipped off, so. I'm the, literally the only person standing here. And it, when the cop looked up, my body just reacted. It reacted on its own. And I ended up running. And I ended up, as I was running, I ended up stumbling a little bit. I ran around a car, and I ended up running down the street. And then as I'm running down the street, I ended up running into another cop. The cop was confused. Like, it was, like, it was a lot going on that night. Like, he didn't know what was going on, the other cop, but as the cop that was chasing me told, told the cop to hold me. I ended up getting taken to the ground. And then at that moment, they put me in handcuffs. And then he pressed charges on me that night. The police officer? Yes, he pressed charges on me that night. Because he thinks that you hit him. He thinks that I hit him. Um, the next day, I went to court. I think it was the, um... Uh, are you in lockup all night? At the time, I was in juvenile detention. Um, I didn't think I was in that much trouble. I even explained to my lawyer, like, she was trying, like, the lady, she was trying to, like, I, she, she was trying to find evidence for me to prove my name for me. But in the beginning, she told me about the bind over here, like, where they can bind you over and charge you as an adult. So in my mind, I'm thinking, like, what? Like, what is that? Like, I never heard of no such thing as a bind over here, like, where you can charge a, a kid as an adult. But, so they ended up charging you as an adult. Yes. And so did you ever get released from custody? I never got released after so I got you, locked so up. So you're, you're in custody. How long did, you, did it take before you were 
sentenced. in front of a judge, uh, sentenced? Um, it took about five months. I was, I, so I you're in custody up. as a 15-year-old. Your summer's ruined. You're supposed to go back to school. You're still in jail. Yes. Right? You plead guilty, right? Yes. Why did you plead guilty? I was scared, like, um, I was yeah, scared. Yeah, but isn't, isn't is somebody advising you, uh, lawyer, family member? No, nobody no. said, hey, you need to fight this? No, like, my lawyer, they did nothing for me. Like, my mom even paid for a lawyer. Like, the lawyer never even came to speak to me. So this me. isn't a public defender, this is... The, the, in the beginning, when I was in juvenile, right. it was a but public defender. But then your defender. mom hired a regular lawyer. When I got winded over and charged in, as an adult, she hired me a lawyer because when I first got charged, it was just a assault on a police officer. Right. When I got binded over, I got charged with six, like five to six more charges. Were they all felony counts? Yes. Oh, so you were facing serious time. I was facing a lot of six, time. Yeah, six rounds. So when you get there and you plead guilty because your lawyer's saying, plead, uh, you know, and you're 50 years old. So the lawyer, the lawyer that my mom paid for, I never spoke to the guy until he, he came in with a plea deal. Like, I never spoke what to him. What was the plea deal? Four years. Hey, Steve. Hey, Mariah. <laughs> I mean, this, this is a story that, you know, when you hear it, and like, you know, like I was even saying to Randy, even if, like, you know, he's saying he didn't, he didn't punch that cop. He got caught right. up in uh, some friends that were doing acting crazy, but I'm saying, let's say he did punch the cop. Mm -hmm. What the hell is, why are they putting this kid in jail for four years for? Like, right, I, that's a tragedy. I right, I don't understand it either. He's a really, really good father. He's very hands-on. Um, he helps when he can, when he's not at work. Um, he makes sure he spends time with the baby. Like, it's a blessing. I'm so blessed to have him. Why is today so important, Mariah? Because I want him to prove his innocence, and not even just for him, for our son. I want our son to grow up and watch this show and see that his daddy, his father never um, gave up on speaking his truth. Yeah. I love you too, man. No, no matter what happens, well, no matter what happens, whether you did or you didn't do it, I love you, you're my son. I would have fought for you, and I did. You know, I want you to be able to move on. Whatever this is, whatever I'm, it is. I'm sorry for having to put you through everything like that. Like, having you have to walk by me every, every step of the way through it. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. This kid done everything that I asked him to do. And it's so weird because I said, son, you had to go to prison to do what I wanted you to do. How hard was that for you to see your 15-year-old son go to prison? When he went to prison, I went to prison. It was the hardest thing I've ever had to experience with any of my children. This is the child. I got seven children. This is the child that I would never expect to go to prison. And I told my son, I said, you go to school, get your education, do and take everything that they had to offer. You take it. You don't have to hold your head down. You hold your head up. You hold your head up. So Randy came here to take a lie detector test to clear his name. And we asked him, did you at any point make any forcible physical contact with any police officer at all on the night in question. He answered no, and the result of Randy's lie detector test is that he told the truth. Oh! If I really say I want to feel, man, I swear to God. I, swear to God. I got so much anger in me right now. Ain't nobody believed me. Nobody believed me. Not even my own mom. I man. did everything I could. Yeah, I didn't. Because, and I'm going to say this. You know, yeah, my record ain't squeaky. And I know the law. 
and I know criminal behavior. And it was so much criminal behavior going on, I'm trying to read the body language. Okay, so when he's real over, he just, and ran. I said, son, I wouldn't want to put that video for a drawer to give you. And that was kind of what led to the pleading guilty kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Again, I, I can't believe a 15-year-old for this. Like, you know, if you're a 15-year-old and you take a gun and you shoot somebody, I believe you should be tried as an adult. But when you're 15 years old and you punch somebody, you certainly shouldn't be tried as an adult. And, you know, I don't care who you're punching. Four years in prison for a punch? I mean, give me a break. That's terrible. That's the um, guy that he named lied on my name. I had to sit here and let these people talk about me, bro. Time out, I'm a menace to society. The man raised his hand, pointing me, talking about, yeah, that's him. He the one that did it. I had people lie on me. I had to sit there and listen. I couldn't, it's, I feel like call, trying to scream for help in a soundproof cell. Can't even, can't nobody hear you. No. Could nobody hear me? I can't, I feel like I can't trust people, so I, I'm always in, at home. It's just hard, like, it's hard. Um, you know, and I'll say this, I, I, I'm glad that you were able to come here today and, and take this test and, and clear what, your name with what happened. And I don't think there's any kind of magic bullet that's going to make a lot of this anger and the way you feel go away. But like with anything in life, you do have good things to focus on, like Mariah, like your little boy. And I think if you spend a lot of time, and that's the great thing about having kids, because if you don't have kids, you spend a lot of time looking at yourself. But if you have kids, Instead of looking at yourself, you start looking at them. And that's where your focus has got to be. And I hope that helps. I want to thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. I hope this helps you. I really do. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for having me. I called you, Steve, for help because I watch your show all the time. Somebody's going to watch this and say, you know what? She was brave enough to do that. I can do that, too.